Hey guys, welcome back to the channel and in this week's video we'll be making a balustrade style coffee table that I'll show you exactly how to do. And I've also included all the dimensions and cut list of the pieces in the description of this video. So if you want to build this for yourself, check out the description and you can do so. We also have a featured product for the sponsor of this week's video, but more on that later. Let's get things started. If you follow my channel, you may recognize this wood as some leftover boss wood from last week's project, which was this bed that I made. While I thought that bed turned out awesome, the problem with making that bed was that I had some of this leftover lumber, which would normally be a good thing, but I've been trying to get rid of this boss wood for some time now, which gave me the perfect opportunity to make a coffee table as I had just the right amount of wood left over. So getting this table started, the first thing we will need to do is to break down what lumber we have into usable pieces, milling them up on the planer, joiner, and table saw to our desired lengths. And if you're wondering if you could substitute pine or 2x4s or any other type of wood in place of this boss wood, the answer to that is absolutely you can use whatever wood you want. I'm just using this boss wood, as I mentioned earlier, to get rid of it. As much as I would love to say that I turned these legs myself on my lathe, that would make me a complete liar because these are from Carolina Leg Company. And as much as I would love to learn to turn these legs myself, the value the Carolina Leg Company offers in these legs is such a good deal that it's hard to pass up and spend the time trying that myself. Anyway, the most efficient way for me to attach the aprons between the legs is to use the domino. Now, if you don't have a domino, you can use pocket holes or dowels, both which are perfectly fine for this application. It might even be a little faster than using the domino. If you are, however, considering adding the domino to your tools that you own, in my opinion, it is 100% worth it due to the precision and the accuracy and repeatable cuts that you can make every single time. The other thing that's cool about the domino is that you can flip the offset of these pieces. So notice on that top piece, the apron was completely flush, but if we flip the bottom piece over, there's a nice offset that's consistent that we can match up on every single piece. And once again, if you don't have a domino, don't be intimidated by this step because you can do the exact same things with pocket holes, which I've done several times in the past. Regardless of the joinery method, the table will look best if that top apron is flushed with the top of the legs and there's maybe a half inch offset on the very bottom. Now this is just a personal preference, but anytime I'm getting ready to glue something together, I always like to dry fit the entire piece together to make sure that I didn't accidentally cut something on the wrong side or there are no surprises that are going to pop up during that glue up. Once we've ensured our glue up will work properly, we can reassemble all the pieces using glue. And because glue ups are not the most exciting thing in the world to talk about, just a reminder that if you do want to make this table, you can find all the dimensions down in the description, as well as all of the tools and products I used in this video in case you are interested in checking any of those out as well. So thus far in the video, we haven't really done anything that difficult or complicated yet. Really, we've just cut out the eight apron pieces and attached them to the legs of the table. Now on the glue up, we want to make sure that our square table is actually square, which is where things get slightly more complicated because we can't put clamps across this to ensure a square glue up. So what we do is measure the distance from the opposite points of the legs. And since this table was slightly off square, I'll clamp one side of the table down to my workbench and then use a clamp to pull the opposite legs just slightly until that measurement is the same, ensuring that this table is perfectly square. Now honestly, it doesn't have to be perfectly square, but the more out of square that it is, the more offset the slats and the tabletop will be once we finish this thing up. All right, so the base of our table is mainly completed other than the slats. So let's go ahead and get started on the top. The top will also be made from the leftover boss wood that I had. And just like we did with those apron pieces earlier, we need to break everything down, mill everything up to the dimensions we want so we can glue these pieces into a tabletop.
The width of the individual tabletop pieces doesn't necessarily matter. In fact, the width of all my pieces were completely random and nothing matched up, and I thought this made it look even better. Opposed to the width, what is important of each of these pieces is the length, being that each of these pieces are as long as the total width of all the pieces put together. So on this table, the total width and length of this tabletop was 36 and a half inches, meaning that all of these pieces are slightly longer than that because we'll flush cut them after the tabletop is glued together, but that width needs to be a cumulative 36 and a half inches as well, or if it ended up a little bit wider, you could always rip it down on the table saw after the tabletop is glued together. Now, whenever I'm putting a smaller tabletop like this together, I usually don't use dowels or dominoes for alignment purposes. The reason being because I'm gonna run both of these slabs through my planer to smooth out any imperfections of my glue up. Now, if you don't have access to a wider planer for these pieces, you could always use biscuits or dowels or whatever other method of joinery in the middle to make sure that a seam lines up. In fact, this method is exactly what I'm going to do on this center joint. Obviously, this entire piece won't fit through my planer, so I have to have this center seam perfect. And to do that, I'll be using dominoes just for alignment purposes, as the strength from this joint will come from the glue seam itself. Those dominoes just help to line everything up. All right, so at this point, our tabletop is coming along nicely. Now, usually on a tabletop glue up like this, I'll let it set overnight or at least sometime until the next day. But because this is a YouTube video, we can skip right ahead to the next day instead of having to watch that glue dry for 12 hours, which might be the most boring thing of all time. After that glue is finally dry, we'll flush cut both ends of the tabletop and remember that we want to flush cut this to the same exact width of this tabletop. So like I mentioned earlier, our width was 36 and a half inches, meaning that our length of the tabletop should be 36 and a half inches as well. With that tabletop done, we can focus our attention on the bottom of the table, which I'll be making from individual slat pieces. These are also milled up out of whatever leftover boss wood that I had. And I wanted these pieces to sit flush with the top of the bottom apron. And the easiest way to do that is just to add an extra piece to that bottom apron, which will serve as a shelf for those slat pieces to sit on. So I pre-drilled some holes to attach that shelf piece with screws, but how we'll line this up is to take all of the off cuts from the slat pieces, line them up where we want on that bottom apron, and then push that shelf right up against those pieces. Then we can glue it in place and attach it with screws for some extra reinforcement. But this way, that bottom shelf will be lined up where those slats will sit down perfectly flush with the top of that bottom apron. We will center these up and attach them to that shelf shortly in the video, but just so you get the idea of what this entire table looks like at this point, I put the slats in place and then threw the top on so we could finally get a look at this thing assembled. At this point, the table was coming along pretty nicely, but I wanted to add an extra brace up under the top for some added support. Now, because everything is already glued in place, we can't use mortise and tenon on the domino, but I came up with a solution of cutting the mortise wider than the board itself on that brace piece. That way we could put the dominoes in place and still manage to sneak that brace piece right in the middle between those aprons. It obviously would have been easier to just put that in place before I glued everything together, but I'm guilty of poorly planning that step out. Anyway, after we put a clamp on the top to keep it in place, I just spaced all the bottom slats out using equal spacing, measuring from the very center, offsetting each piece, and then I secured them just with glue and clamps. While that glue is drying, let's take a look at our product sponsor of today's video, which is the Pura Systems 1100G air filter. As a disclaimer, the company did reach out and send this product to me for testing and review in this video. 
But anyway, this is a standard square design air filter that can be hung multiple ways from the ceiling. I actually had some spare chain that I'll do an even different way, but all of the chain supply are able to hold this thing from the ceiling in whatever way works best for you. This guy is 110 volt power with a remote control turn on. It has three speeds and it includes an ionizer for additional filtration. The manual on this claims a whopping 1100 CFM and I was able to measure the outflow wind speed of up to 25 miles an hour using my handheld anemometer. On the other side where the filters are, we can see that the airflow is being drawn in that as well. And speaking of the filter, this is a two-stage filter with a removable 5 micron filter on the outside followed by 3 micron filters on the inside. Now as I mentioned, there are multiple ways to hang this up with the hardware included, but because my ceiling has open beams, I grabbed some spare chains and hung it even a different way than is offered. Anyway, having clean air to breathe is an extremely important part of woodworking, so check out this product if you're interested. And now, let's get back to the coffee table build. So at this point, the slats are in place, the base and the tabletop are all glued together, meaning we're at the stage of detailing all of the pieces to make them look nice. So we grab a round over bit, trim all the edges on the tabletop, sand everything down nice and smooth, to get all of our pieces ready for paint and stain. For the paint, I'm using two coats of white primer followed by two coats of enamel gloss paint. Using a sprayer opposed to a brush is a great way to not only improve your time and efficiency, but also the quality of the finish you get. The top of this table is stained with Minwax Espresso, and normally when I'm staining tabletops, I'll do the bottom first to make sure I like the color. But if you're hungry for more details and you're curious on how to get an absolutely perfect stain and polyurethane finish on a top, check out the video at the top of the screen where I go into far more detail as far as what to do and what not to do whenever you're staining and clear coating a tabletop or any other project you may be working on. The polyurethane itself is Minwax Gloss Polyurethane. I've used it several times and usually can get a pretty good result. The thing with this polyurethane, however, is that it's almost guaranteed to look terrible after one coat. So after the first coat, we're going to sand this down using 400 or finer grit sandpaper just gently, clean it off with mineral spirits, and then we'll do additional coats until we are satisfied with the result. Normally I do at least three coats. You can do more if you want more protection, but usually three is sufficient for a nice finish on a tabletop. When attaching the top to the base, we have to remember to consider wood movement. And I do this by using Z clips to attach the tabletop. So we first cut a slot using the slot cutting router bit, and then the Z clips can pop right down into those slots. The top is then set in place and centered, and we can attach the top to those Z clips using screws that go through the Z clip right up into the tabletop. If you followed the steps in this video, your end product should look something like this. But anyway, that'll wrap this video up. So if you made it this far in the video, thank you for watching. Drop a comment down below letting me know what you think. As always, stay tuned for more, and I'll see you in the next video.